the Apostle Paul said there were two signs that are needed in order for the day of Christ to occur. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Note that Paul says, the day shall not come except there come a falling away first. 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 In other, in other words, we cannot have anything continuing on where the Lord's end time prophecies can occur unless falling away happens. So you need to understand falling away has to happen in the city that we're living in. Falling away has to happen in your own home and your family at times. Falling away has to happen in your church at times. Falling away even has to happen sometimes with yourself. The falling away must occur. As a Bible-believing church, the Lord has done great miracles and wonders how we survived and how we thrived under persecution and communism. And I don't care what you say, it's communism. And how we were able to win hundreds of souls to salvation. Thousands of tracts being passed out in a God-forsaken community of Silicon Valley and San Francisco Bay Area. And only an almighty God can do something great like that. And then the fellowship's been sweet, the singing's been sweet, the preaching's been sweet, soul winning's been sweet. Our attendance has been sweet. The practice, the rebuilding of what we're doing with this great work that we're doing has been sweet. But there will come a time when the devil tries to put his foot in and tries to call a, cause a falling away. Sometimes uh, I would say to myself, which is a bad thing to say, but I would sometimes say it's too good to be true. Whenever the church runs and the Lord blesses us, I'll just say it's too good to be true. Why? Because I've just been so much used to living in a day and age of falling away. It has surrounded me. And I want to preach to this church what can encourage you as the falling away rises, what can prevent this church from falling away? Amen. I said at times it could happen to yourself or even in this church, but it can be only at times. You can pick yourself back up. Right. And you don't have to completely fall down, defeated, and let the devil take over. Amen. When the falling away comes... I want to tell you nine points on why you fall and why the falling away occurs, occurs and what would prevent you to fall away. The title of my message today is The Falling Away. Let's pray. Father God, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and wash away my sins with your blood. Same day, every Sunday, Lord. I'm just going to leave the rest in your hands. Um, I don't know if this sermon will be a great job, but I'm just going to do what you call me to do, to preach. Amen. I'm going to let your word have the power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I want you to turn to Romans 14. Romans chapter 14. Turn to Romans 14. My first point is falling from criticizing. Falling from criticizing. What can cause this church to fall is one person, it only takes one, to start saying something bad about somebody else. What can cause the church to fall down flat and lose everything is just one sensitivity coming out that the devil tempts in your mind. You know why? Because it takes a whole bunch of encouragement to bring one to church. But it only takes one criticism to chase many people out of church. And that's important to understand. Look at Romans chapter 14 and verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or fallen. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Notice right here that a person can fall. 
And when a brother and sister in Christ falls, it is not your job to point out where that person falls in because you just might help them out. If you talk about their falling, guess what? They will fall. You might help them out and they will definitely fall. No thanks to you. And it is important to understand that criticism must stop. You might say, why should I do that? Because the verse points out right here that when you start to judge a different brother or sister in Christ, it says, who art thou? Yeah. Did you see that at verse 4? Who art thou? Yeah. Meaning, who do you think you are? To judge and say that person is wrong. Why? Because who are you? You're not the master. The verse says the next part. To his own master he standeth or falleth. Do you see that? God's saying don't judge that brother and sister in Christ. Because I'm the master. When that person falls down, uh, falls down or stands up. That's for me to decide. That's for me to decide. And it's important to understand that you can't take over God's position as master and tell God, hey, God, I'm like you and I'm actually the master here. So that brother in Christ needs to blah, 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 blah. And this sister in Christ, blah, 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 blah. Who do you think you are? I'd be scared if I were you to take God's position and place. You know what that verse says? Who art thou? It's God. God is the master who judges. So before you open a criticism, remember this. Are you God? Are you God? Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Got to be careful of that judgmental attitude. It's so easy to judge things very easily because it's easy to think something negative about somebody in our thought like it's drinking water. It's an automatic reaction. You have no self-control. You may not even say it, but it's easy to think it. And then remember, when you do that, God's knocking on the door of your heart and saying, Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Are you the master? Well, that person should do this and that person should do that. Then you're, you be the master. You be the one in charge. Let's see how well it goes after that. Not so good, right? Probably cause a bigger split. Yeah. Probably cause more harm to that person and to yourself. You know, it's not just the person who judges, but the person being judged as well. You know, you might be the person being judged. And you might feel bad that I messed up again and I sinned again. And I've caused a problem to the church. I'm just a burden. I think I should leave. The Bible says, to his own master he standeth or falleth. Yeah. That applies to you too, yeah. sir and ma'am. Right. What does that mean? You're not the master who tells yourself what to do. I'm the one that's fallen. That's good, brother. Come on. God is the master who tells you, hey, get up. And when he tells you to get up, get up. Why? Right, but I sinned. And I messed up again. And God says, no, get up. He's the master. He's the one in charge. He's the one on the throne. Not you. Not you. You can't tell yourself what to do. Oh, sinner, I can't come back to church. Don't tell me that he Get yourself back up because God's the master. He's on the throne. He's on the throne. So if God's the master, what do you think he wants you to do? You know what he wants you to do. Plead the blood. He wants you to repent. He wants you to clean up your act and get back to church. Get back to reading the word. Get back to praying. Because you're not the master. He is. That will prevent the church from falling. And what causes the church to fall is criticism. You critique yourself and then you critique others around you. You've got to watch out for that. The devil will use that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> and then 1 Timothy 3. 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Timothy 3. My second point is falling from conceit. Falling from conceit. 
the biggest danger or one of the biggest dangers that causes a church to fall is that I think I'm right mentality. You know that? You know why the church is so divisive and so messed up? Because there's so many wrong doctrines. Why, why did these wrong doctrines come out? It's because these people thought they're right about their teaching. And so they shamelessly start something online. When the Bible came out and the Christians start teaching and preaching the word, no problem right there until some so-and-so in the church said, well, I think you should be more technical about that. Well, you know, uh, I don't think Romans 10.9 means this in this way. Uh -huh. well, that's you know, that's when those down. thinking you're right mentality comes out. And it disgusts me to a point. Yeah. It's wickedness sent from hell. And you can pretend you're pious and sing a hymn and pretend you're a Bible believer. Say nice words to appeal the audience. Fine, have the audience who loves itching ears. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, there you go. The Bible says that's Come a on. sign of a false pastor. Yep. Yeah. That's right. You got to get rid of that thinking you're right mentality. It's the most, one of the most worst things amongst Bible believers as well. Yeah, it is. Because sometimes you don't need to create a divisive doctrine. Yeah, amen. If, don't get me wrong, I believe in growing. I believe in growing in the Word, getting deeper into the book. But I don't believe that you go so deep into the doctrine and say a whole bunch of stuff where it's worth it, where you cause more harm than good yeah, to the right. body of Christ. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Sometimes there are some things it's best that you keep to yourself. I say a whole bunch of stuff online. So I know what I'm talking about. Because I say a whole bunch of controversial stuff. But that's why it's important when I say I could be wrong. Or I'll just say it's my theory. Or I'll just say it's my opinion. It's important to do that. 1 Corinthians 10.12 says... Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Keep your hand there. 1 Timothy 3, verse 6 says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, yep. he fall into the condemnation yep. of the devil. Here are these people who think they're right about a doctrine. Oh boy. Here are these people who think they're right about how things should be run in the Come church. On. Come on. Here are these people who think they're right about a certain argument they had with a fellow church member or fellow family member. Oh, yeah. That's good. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone thinks they're right. Come on, preacher. And you know what you are? You know, the, even novices think that they're specialists in their arguments. You know that? Even novices think they're professional debaters. You might say, how so? Because they... Verse 6, not a novice less being lifted up with pride. Mm -hmm. See, pride is, I am better than you, and I know I'm right and you're wrong. And you know who has the tendency to think that? Novices. Mm -hmm. Novices. You're a novice. Every 11-year-old or 12-year-old teenagers think they're more right than, than some professional grown adult who's working at the workplace. That happens. Every novice thinks like that. Every church member thinks, oh, I know more than the pastor. Come on. Every pastor who is a young age thinks, oh, I'm better than the older pastor. Mm, come on. Novice, novice. See, everyone falls into this trap. The trap is when you think that you're right, and then you stubbornly cling on to that, the Bible says, take heed, lest you fall. Take heed. This is take heed. You gotta be very careful of that. You gotta be very careful of that. You might say, well, how do I prevent myself from falling in my own conceit here, Pastor? In my pride, in that thinking I'm right mentality. The problem is, you always try to find things that you're right on. That's the thing. The verse is. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So there might be some Christians who go, oh, I can't think I'm right. And then they always get paranoid about being wrong, right? And then when they come to this pulpit and preach the word of God, they're like, I don't want to let the pride get the best of me. Oh, I might slip up. Oh, I might mess up. No, I'm not telling you to do that. You have to be confident in what you preach is the truth and what is right. And you might say, well, uh, what, if, uh, what if it turns out that 
You'll be pride then, Pastor. What if I'm stuck in that thinking right mentality? Simple. Think about what if you turn out to be wrong. Will you accept that? It's that simple. That will prevent you from falling in pride. That's good, what will prevent you from falling in pride? When I come up and preach the word of God in this pulpit, I don't go in fear and feeling intimidated and lack confidence. No, I do it with confidence and boldness, knowing that what I preach and teach is right. But when I do that, what if I'm wrong? I'm still confident, even when I'm wrong, not just when I'm right. You might say, why? Because my heart is willing to change. That's God good, shows brother. Yeah, yeah, that's good, brother. And that's your problem. You never think that. You never think God's going to show you what's wrong that you need to change. You think in every sermon, you're right. Every Come teaching, on. you're right. Come on. Every time you talk to a person, you're right. Family member, church member, work, uh, workmate, whatever, co-worker, you think you're right. That's why you're going to fall from conceit. <clears throat> if you have it in your heart, that verse is, let him that thinketh he standeth. See that? You have the wrong thought. You have the wrong thought. You're only thinking about, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand. No, you have to think about, what about when I fall? If that verse says, if you think you fall, that might be more powerful, right, in verse 12? In verse 12, wherefore, let him that thinketh he falleth, maybe, might be the opposite. I have to think about when I fall, that way I can stand. Whenever I fall, okay, I'm going to fall if I walk over there. So in order to prevent me from falling, I'm going to stay right here. Then I still stand, right? Yeah. you got to think about where you fall. That way you can stand. That's when you know you're conceited. Is that if you never think like that. Have boldness and confidence when you stand and when you fall. When you do that, the Lord can do something great with you. You know how you can split this church? When every one of you, listen up now, when every single one of you, including the pastor, thinks that he or she is right. Yes, sir. And I guarantee you this, we will, we as a church will fall. You know what keeps this church from falling? They always think about the best of the other person, what they say. You know what they do? They are humble and say, if there's something I'm wrong, I need to change it. And if you retain that church, we're not going to fall. But the falling away occurs because people fall from conceit, thinking I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, you're wrong. That's why people walk out mad at the church when they get upset at the preaching. They're thinking like, you pastor think you're arrogant and you're always right. When you say that, you're automatically saying, I'm the one that's, that's, right. Right. Yeah, that's right. And you're the one that's wrong, pastor. That's what some people misunderstand. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 7. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. Falling from credibility. Falling from credibility. What, why so many people in churches fall is because they lack a credible testimony. And because they lack a credible testimony, they could care less. And that's why they walk inside church not caring the way they dress. That's why they say stuff in church not caring what they say will have repercussions. That's the reason why they'll even teach stuff on this pulpit where they, where they could care less what people think. They, get, they come to church the way they attend, the way they converse, the way they behave. They could care less. And that's why churches fall if you're that type of person. One bad thing about the American culture is we're too independent in mindset. Independence is a good thing. But that independence becomes a dangerous thing where I could care less what other people say think or say about me, I'm going to do what I want. Yeah. That's why it attracts rebels sometimes too. Yeah. And yeah, I know the government's corrupt and the new world order is going to rise. I hate that too. And then I preach hard against it and I expose the errors. But sometimes that's an attraction for some people who are lost. Yes, they're even unsaved people too who are attracted to that. You think it's all Christian. No, it's not. It's an attraction to people who have an independence who don't want to be bound. Yeah. And that can be a dangerous thing because when people are too independent, they're like, I could care less what other people think about me. Let me do whatever I want. Yeah. You know what that means? Chaos. Yeah. That means chaos. Look at verse 7. 
Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, without, lest he what? Fall, fall into reproach and the who? Snare of the devil. The devil gets you. If you lack credibility, the devil gets you. Well, I'm right about this. It doesn't matter if you think that you proved your point and you're right about something. The point is, did the devil, was the devil able to take advantage of that? To give you a bad name, bad testimony. Is it true that the Bible says that uh, God hates the wicked? Yeah. He can hate homosexuality so much that he hates LGBTQ people. Is that right? Yes, yes that's in the yeah. scripture. It's scriptural. It's right. You proved your point. Well, if I did that in soul winning to an LGBTQ person, do you think the devil could take advantage of what I'd said? Yeah. Yeah. And use that to ruin the church? It's not about proving your point yeah. or your work, because then you're all about your image then, huh? Mm -hmm. Yourself, how you yeah. feel. You know, you gotta see how other people view you. You gotta watch your testimony. Because there's a good chance that if other people view you negatively, listen up now, if other people are currently viewing you negatively, there might be a good chance people in church are viewing you negatively. And if that's the case that people in church are viewing you negatively, Definitely, the pastor was way ahead and views you negatively too. Watch your testimony. You can fall because you lack credibility. You gotta watch your testimony. Oh, well, it's not a big deal, you know. I'm gonna preach and teach whatever God lays on my heart. Whatever God lays on your heart or whatever you think God lays on your heart. Whatever you feel God lays on your heart. That's your problem, man. Because God's not gonna go against God's not going to go against a good report. How have people described you, huh? If there is one word that people describes you about your character, what would they say? If there is a negative, let's make this better. If there is a negative character attribute that you have, what do you think the people are going to discover and use that on you? Person. If I was, if you were to pick one character deficit of a certain person that you're thinking about in this room, what negative character deficit would that be? See? Report, testimony is a big deal because people are observing you all the time. And they might just say, you're just too nosy. You're just too talkative. You're just, uh, you lack manners. You're too rough. You're too mean. You're too soft. You're overtly sensitive. You, you're complaining a lot. Whiner. See that? What would prevent a church from falling is to have a good report. But if you have a bad report, I guarantee you this, the church will fall apart. It will fall apart. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. My fourth point is falling from comforts. Falling from comforts. Now, if someone has an opportunity to get inside a good school, I went there too. Man, uh, Lord's blessing goes go with you. I'm happy for you. If you find a place to move that you can be more comfortable and enjoy life, and you can see a good future for your family, hey, God's blessing go on you. I'm actually happy for you. Good job opportunity, I'm happy for you. If any one of you win a million dollars, I'll be happy for you. Have at it. But the problem is this. A lot of times, when comforts come to our life, come on. Come on. basically opportunities to be comfortable in life, it becomes more of an advantage for Satan to make you fall. You might say, how so? Let's say that uh, you had a great job opportunity in a different state. And then you're like, man, I want to go over there. But you never sought God's will. You never prayed to him about it. And then you moved out and you left your Bible-believing church. And then over there at that great, uh, at that workplace over there, no Bible-believing church nearby. And you just went over there. And then what will happen to you spiritually? It's more of a snare opportunity for Satan to ruin your life, isn't it? Yeah. 
Good college to go to, great, have at it. Good school for your kids, great, have at it. But then the teacher and the environment corrupt your child's mindset. But it's a good school, great opportunity, want a scholarship. Yeah, but getting too comfortable, a big opportunity, can ruin your life. That's why people fall. Because the devil opens up an opportunity for you. Hey, new house, new job, new life, new family. Look at that guy you like. Look at that girl you like. And when he makes it open opportunity yeah. for you to grab it, that's why you fall. Oh, yeah. You know why the past uh, 100 years we've seen our nation falling apart so bad? It was an open opportunity to sin. Mm -hmm. It was an easier access because money is cheaper to buy this rather than going to driving a long ways to church. That's why churches fall. That's why people in church fall. Look at the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. And they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. I would dare say, no, not dare say, I would boldly say this unashamedly, that this wicked device has caused more harm to the yeah. body of Christ and in society and civilization and our whole world. Uh -huh. hey. You might say, why is that? Because it's an open opportunity to... Uh -huh. It's easier to buy certain stuff. It's easier to be exposed to wrong garbage feeding you wrong information. It's easier to get into wrong doctrine. Easier, more than ever before. And you think you're an expert in theology after you hear 20 false pastors. No, your IQ just dropped even lower after that. That's the problem. It has been a satanic and evil device because of comforts. You have to always check and ask yourself, why, did, why am I falling in my Christian life? You got too much opportunity. Too much easy access. Because if God locked all the doors in this building for six months, then maybe our spiritual lives would be better once the six months ended and we left. Why? Because everyone's keeping an eye on each other. You get preaching, teaching, brethren around you. You have no opportunity to sin. Yeah. To make your flesh comfortable. That's good, brother. Amen. But no, once you get out, once those doors open, you go out, the world is exposed all around you. Any access to sin is all around you. And you're going to fall. You know what you need to do? You need to put boundaries. The problem with people today is they think that they're, they're strong enough. Oh yeah, I know there's an op open opportunity to the world and sin and trying to allure my lust, but I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl, I can handle it. Mm. And then unconsciously, it's been bringing you down lower and lower, and you know it, and you know you've been falling, and you're different from what you were spiritually once were before. Why? Because you never put a boundary. You know, you know what will prevent you? That's good. From falling, you put boundaries. Yes, I believe in rules. Amen. <laughs> I believe in rules. But I can't make the rule for you. You're a big boy. You're a big girl. Come on. Why don't you make the rules yourself? Rather than asking Pastor Kim to make the rules for you and then create a Mormon creed of hundreds of rules. <laughs> Why don't you? You have no rules? Mm. Wake up early in the morning. Read the Bible first thing. That TV... Is sin. Avoid it. Don't touch electronics for five hours once you wake up. Then you can go back to it. When you drive, stick to those roads. You have no morals, do you? No rules. Come on. That will prevent you from falling if you put rules for yourself. Yeah. But if I were to call, if I were to cold call anyone right here and say, what are your rules of living? What are your rules of everyday life? Do you have a rule? Come on. Do any of you have a rule? That's why you fall into comforts, and the comforts 
guides your flesh and it gets you out of church? Why are there some people who don't come to church anymore? There was opportunity, opportunity oh, yeah. for something more comfortable out there. Yeah. My fifth point, go to Hebrews 4, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. My fifth point is falling from chores. Falling from chores. What would prevent you from falling in your Christian life is you need to get yourself real busy. You need to make yourself busy and preoccupied. Yeah. And let me tell you something. The devil knew that. And so because the devil knew that, he was like, how am I going to get them not to attend church? Not to read the Bible? Not to pray? Oh, I'll make them busy. Oh, yeah. More yeah. hours in work. More hours in school. More hours of rest for my health or more opportunity in the world for them to spend time on that they're so busy. You know, the devil knew that. So why don't you use the same logic and go backwards on the devil who will prevent me from sinning. I need to get busy in yeah, something that's spiritual. Good, brother. That's good. Who will prevent me from falling into wrong doctrine. I need to get busy yeah. into going to my local church. Yeah. And I mean a Bible-believing church, not a false church, a Bible-believing church. Get more involved. You need to get busy, too. And that will prevent you from getting into the devil's snares. Are you busy? Or you got too much time on your hands? Yeah, you got too much time on your hands in the worldly stuff, don't you? You've been busy in the world stuff. That's why the devil caught you. You need to override that with something else that's busier. My time with God. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Didn't you know there are people who never labored, who didn't get involved in God's ministry, in a local Bible-believing church, and then they come out as unbelieving, and you're like, what happened to you? Yeah. I know people went to PBI, and they became like, Wow, agnostic, and I'm like, where'd you, where'd you come from? You know why? You didn't get involved in a local Bible-believing church. That's why. You need to get yourself busy in church. Even the smallest things, like, you know, uh, one thing I like about this church, and I hope it'll continue, is that once ch church ends, nobody's in a rush to go home. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. People are just want to take time to eat, be busy with eating. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Be busy with talking to some brother and sister, amen? amen? Be busy to play. Be busy to sing. Be busy to clean. And if you're a kid, be busy to play around with the other kids in here. Rather than the messed up kids in the public schools. You know, that's the thing, is that if we are to continue this labor, it'll prevent us from falling. But you know why you fall? You don't get more involved. You know, when I was so busy with work and with college, you know what I strongly believed in? Getting involved with anything that the church has. I never skipped street preaching. I never skipped Wednesday services, Sunday. And I did whatever I could to attend the fellowships. Why? Because I believed in this strongly. If Brother Spurgeon was going to some Bible-believing churches, I would drive three hours to go there while doing my homework in the back of the pew. During break time. You might say, why did you do that? Because I believe it was so important so that I don't fall. It's good, brother. Amen. Good. I was craving. I needed something spiritual. I need preaching from a great preacher. Amen. So that I don't fall. I was laboring. Well, it's a lot of hard work. The Bible says it's yeah. labor. It's a chore. Come on. It's a chore. Just like your work. Just like your school. Just like every day. All right? It's the same thing. So guess what? Nothing's easy in life. So, get to work. Amen. You need to labor so that you don't fall. Get involved with anything and everything as possible because it won't be far long until you fall. It won't be far long until you fall. That's why churches fall. Why? They don't get strongly involved in the things of God. Here's one thought. You ever wondered why mega churches grow real big? Because they're so actively involved. But they're actively involved in the wrong thing. But then now we got Bible-believing churches just come inside and leave. That's it. That's why those churches will grow bigger and ours will grow smaller. 
Be involved. Be involved. Even if you're out of church, you can be involved. How so? Maybe pastor can give you something that he needs you to do to help out the ministry. Just get yourself so busy. Reading the word, praying, your alone time with him. Get you work on that. Go to soul winning. It's a chore, I know. But have you ever felt rested after that? Amen, 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 amen. After a long jury blowout, all of a sudden you just feel refreshed. Woo! That verse says to get to the rest, you need to labor to get into it. You need to put every sweat, every effort, every push that you can so that you can get that rest you need. You want that rest, then you need to work for it. Otherwise, you will fall. You know why you're going to fall? You don't feel rested. Mm. You, you are going through a hard time. You're depressed. You're weary with sin. Feeling guilty of letting God down. And how can you have rest after that? But then after you work hard for the church, you especially lead a soul to salvation. You finally have the courage to talk to somebody and witness to that soul and lead that person to Christ. Amen. What happens here? You're like, I can do more. And then you feel like you can last a couple more days yeah. for the Lord. Yeah, pray to the Lord. But you can't do that if you always go, oh, it's too hard and I'm afraid of work. Come on. Then guess what? If you're afraid of work, you'll never be rested. You always wrestle with a guilty conscience, bad things happening in your life where the Lord doesn't really intervene and move in your life. And where the world of flesh and the devil... You might think it's temporary satisfaction, but at, the same time, but, but at the same time, it's wearing you down. Making you feel groggy, depressed, and wanting more, if that made any sense to you. Look at 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. Falling from certainty. Falling from certainty. We got 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. Verse 5. You know why churches fall? They are not certain. That is hugely important. You need to make your calling and election sure. You know why uh, I didn't fall into the world? Because I knew for certain that my life would be more miserable and sin if I went to the world. Amen. Amen. But you know why you people fall into the world? You don't feel that certain about it. See, you need to make it certain. How do I make it certain? You need to hear more preaching. You need to write verses. You need to memorize and remember them, especially. Otherwise, the devil's going to tempt you with the same thing that isn't that thing in the world much better to offer. And then you forgot the sermon in summer camp that got you right with God. Mm. Yeah. See, you didn't make things certain in your life. You know what prevented me from agnosticism? I already made it certain, fully persuaded, that there is a God. And if there is a God, that's why I have no choice to go into in life. But you know why people fall away? You ever wonder why these church kids fall and act like agnostics when they go to college? They never made their calling and election sure. They just went to church because it's just church. Yeah. Hey, y'all listening? I hope you're not that person. Because you will fall then. Yeah. What will prevent you from falling is to make it sure. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 10. The Bible says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall what? Never fall. I'll teach Amen. you how you, you don't fall. Make it sure. Yeah. Lock proof. Woo! That's the problem with you Christians. You don't make it lock proof. Yeah. You make that opportunity to sin, like I mentioned before, wide open. You didn't make it lock proof. What would make it? Lock proof, 100% sure, I'm not going to fall into that sin. Did you ever do that? Come on. What would make it lock proof, 100% sure, this is what's going to drag me to church? You ever thought what would make, you, make it lock proof, where you can start reading the word and praying, okay, I have a plan, I'm going to do this, and that will make it lock proof, I'm going to read my Bible and pray. You ever done that? No, you haven't. The teachings I heard from this church and from this pastor, I need to make it lock-proof. And not just, mm, no, I need to make it lock-proof. Amen. 
and make it sure that I believe what I'm hearing and can get convicted and changed, not just sit down and go, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you will fall. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what you need to do? Make it sure! Then you'll change. Then you'll stay in the pace. You know why I can't go back to the world? Why I can't live my life as a lost atheist into the pleasures of sin? You know why I can't do that? I know too much. Oh, yeah. Amen. And I know that book is true. And I know I'm, I'm afraid to yeah. turn my back on God. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Why? Because I know for sure. Amen. Woo. That's good. Amen. You need to make uh, you need to make a checklist and make it lock proof sure. Not just that's good. You gotta read the Bible. Come on, you gotta go read the Bible. No, it's lock proof that I am going to read the Bible because I made it sure. Yeah. I made a plan that's going to kick my tail and make me read the book. Yeah. Amen. My seventh point is falling from corruption. Falling from corruption. Look at 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. It's so important that the church does not fall. But you notice from these examples, I want you to look at yourself and see, wow, these are things I haven't prepared for. And these things could take opportunity to make me fall. I hope you're learning from this so that this church can continue. I want Bible Baptist Church to go on till the rapture sounds. Yeah. Amen. Two locations and be a good testimony to the Lord. And us to retain this atmosphere, this joy, this power, this fruit. Because I've seen it go up and then down like a roller coaster. I want this to be retained. What would prevent us from falling away from this and to retain it? You look at these cases. And you need to check yourselves and see, have I fallen in any of these cases? Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Falling from corruption. Falling from corruption. The Bible says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. You're a real Bible believer. You subscribe to us. You even join our RBB. But then there was some wrong doctrine out there, and then you fell away. And you got mad at Pastor Kim. That's what happened. Same thing with the people in this church. It's not just wrong doctrine. It says error, right, of the wicked. So that's sin. And that messed up, nasty, wicked, heinous, ungodly flesh just puts the most ridiculous thought in your mind that you never thought you would think before, and then you start to meditate on that, and then let the heart feel it, that eventually you even did it. You know why? You entertained it. You didn't beware of it. You know why you got messed up in wrong doctrine? Here's, uh, this is what you onlineers need to hear. Ready for this? I get so many comments on this. That, oh man, I get so messed up in wrong doctrine. It's so confusing out there. Beware of them. Yeah. Not keep clicking. Yeah. YouTube yeah. is built for you to click, click, click. You know what you need to do? Get off! Yeah. Yes. Beware! That's the problem. You know why you let sin, you know why you committed that sin? How did I get here? How did this ever happen? Because you let it slip in your mind. Yeah, you're preaching, brother. Come you on. You know what the verse says? Beware. What does beware mean? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. you ever were paranoid of something? Traumatized by something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need to put that with sin and wrong doctrine. That's good, brother. Amen. Like, if I say our God is sovereign, you automatically should go. <laughs> but then if I say our God is sovereign, in the sense that everything is under his control, but uh, he still gives you free will, then you go, oh. That's how you should be doing it, all right? You should be going like this. Why? It's a good first reaction against wrong doctrine and sin that prevents you from falling into it. That's good, brother. But you know how you fall into it all the time? You don't put your guard up, you go, Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, I love you. <laughs> Some of you are laughing, but you don't realize that 
you did love it. Yeah, you come on, it, brother. Right, it became come on. part of you. Good, so what you wanted to prevent was a negative spirit, a pessimist spirit, a depressed spirit. You actually hugged it. It became a part of you, and you started acting like depression now. A pessimist, a negative person. See? That's what happened. You got to beware. If you catch yourself saying it, looking at it, hearing something about it, or doing it, you got a first reaction go, yeah. All right. That's your first reaction. You need yeah. to be aware. You need, yes, I believe in trauma. That's and I mean the trauma Amen. of all doctrine and sin. Amen. Be traumatized by that. If you're like, first reaction, like, ah, stay away from me. Yeah. As soon as your worldly friend plays the music, like, jump out of the car or something. Like Amen. That. I'm riding with that. <laughs> now, of course, I'm being overdramatic about it, but you understand my point. Come on. You know why churches fall? People in church fall? They let it swim. Yeah. They tolerate it. Yeah. Because we live in a world of toleration. Whoa. Tolerate, tolerate, because I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl. No, you gotta go, whoa! Yeah, come on. That's the first thing you need to do. Right? Some guppy gets up here in skinny jeans and playing electric guitar with the uh, drum band going off. The first reaction should be, whoa! Like that. All right, let's look at Revelation 2. Revelation so chapter you, 2. Brother. Amen. That's why you still mess up in sin. That's why you're addicted to sin. That's why you're messed up with wrong doctrine and you're addicted to it. You know why? Because you didn't beware. You didn't beware. Instead, it looked real good because the subscription numbers looked really high. And the views looked high. And the title looked really good. And the thumbnail looked good. And you made, it made you go, oh. Oh. And then brainwash you. Yeah. You know what you should do? You should go, Ugh! Amen. Beware. That's good. Now I know you're all laughing, but I hope you understand why I'm yeah, yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. emphasize yeah. you. Do you understand how to prevent yourself from falling into sin and wrong doctrine? It's called beware. beware. It's called yeah. it's called being traumatized that the first reaction is to get it away from you. Yeah. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Falling from checking. Falling from checking. Look at Revelation 2, 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You know why uh, people fall? They don't remember. They don't remember. They, don't, they forgot the sermon that was preached. They forgot the doctrine that was taught that would have helped them. They forgot their experience with God. They forgot the miracle that God has provided that they were so grateful for. They forgot the answer to prayer that seemed impossible. And you're like, man, what a great God that can answer prayer. You forgot those. You need to remember where you fell. You need to remember where you fell. Well, how can I remember where I fell? You need to remember. Now, that might sound stupid, but let me just make it... Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is... Come on, this. brother. You're like, well, I don't know where I fell. I don't know where I fell. Hey, stupid, stop and think. Yeah, that's right, That's brother. what I mean by remember, yeah. okay? Not just, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Remember, okay? Stop, think. Just sit down. You're so, you're so used to this. I gotta do something. I gotta do something. Five programs. Ah! Shut it off. Sit down. Pray to the Lord. Yeah, and right. say, God help me. Remember where I fell. Yeah. Show it to me. And then just stop and think a little bit. And make a checklist. You know my prayer life could be better. Yeah. My Bible reading could be better. My attitude toward my brother and sister in Christ could be better. You know, I thought I was faithful, but you know what? I'm not as faithful enough. You need to do that. That way you don't fall. You know why people in church fall? They don't keep a checklist of their weaknesses. The Bible says, remember where thou art fallen. And when you do that, you know what you need to do? You need to repent. Problem with people is they know all the wrong things they do, but they don't repent. Because they have a defeatist attitude saying, well, I can't get myself back up. Look, if you repent, it's under the blood, it's covered, and God will give you grace to help you, 
and if you fall again, as long as you remember it and repent of it, hey, God will help you out. Glory okay? to God. Now get your butt back into church. Amen. But you need to do that. You need to repent and do the first works. When you repent and say, God, I have a change of mind. I get this thing right with you. Then you got to do the first works. And God says, okay, you know what it is. Yes, Lord, I'm ready, okay. I'm going to stop the marijuana smoking addiction and everything. And God says, go to church. And you're like, oh, but I'm too busy. But see, you don't. That's why you keep falling. God says, you remember, you repent, and do the first works. Open up that book. No, God, there's got to be a special program that will help me conquer this addiction. And God says, open that book, yeah. Amen. and read all the way in your Bible. I'm, I want to show you something. It's the first work. It's so basic. But the basic, no matter how strong, all the stuff that I learned in counseling, psychology, and everything, I realize that the basic of God always works. And it's Amen. always better. You need to do it. The first works. Not the high works. The Thank first you, works. Amen. First works. Remember, repent, do the basic work. Amen. See, that's why you keep falling down. You have a high level standard. Like, I'm going to do a total 180 and this is... <laughs> see, just do the first work. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to just trust and obey. That's right. You're doing a good job. So just keep, keep hey, it up. Man. Amen, brother. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. My last point. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Falling from church. Falling from church. You must understand that in order for you not to fall, that you are in a day and age of a church where the Bible prophesied the church will fall. That is important to understand. It's so discouraging for Bible believers nowadays when they look at fellow Bible believers around them or even in their own church or maybe even their own pastor that, hey, things are falling apart. The world around me is falling apart and that causes them to fall apart. You have to remember this. That, was, that would have been my excuse, but what kept me going was, look, it's not my church. It's about me. The Bible says the church will fall. What if I lose people? Am I going to lose my faith in God? No. If all of you left, I already have something real that I know. And I'll keep marching on. Why? Yeah. Revival is not found in a whole bunch of people. It's me and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will give yeah. me the people, the resources, the money, or whatever. Yeah. And I need to keep that in my mind. That way I don't fall. You know why you fall? You see the church fall. So then you fall along with it. You know what? Let me tell you something. The Bible prophesied the church will fall. Yeah. So what are you going to do now? You know what you need to do? You need to keep preaching that book, keep teaching the word of God, keep living clean when the church falls. The Bible says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. The church will fall. And when the church falls, God expects that when the day comes and he starts to rapture his saints and the first half of that day of Christ starts to launch and begin, that God expects a Christian, one of you, he expects you to be the one to read the book. You to be the one to soul with. Woo! You to be the one to pray. Yeah. You Glory to God. Stay Glory away from sin. When all the people don't stay away from sin. When the people in the church refuse to sin. When the people in the church refuse to live right for God. When the people in the church are sensitive and whiners. You must be not a part of that and keep putting in the right spirit, a powerful spirit, a positive spirit. And bring the joy of the Lord into this church even if others don't. The falling away happens and bless God by his grace. I am going to keep preaching out of that King James Bible. Hey. Even if people hey. in the church fall hey. apart to God. And you'll still Woo. see me standing at the rapture. Hey. Now how about you? Hey. Amen. Hey.